upon my ear is falling Then I know the sins of earth beset on every hand Doubt and fear and things of earth in vain to me are calling None of these shall move me from Beulah land I'm living on the mountain Underneath the cloudless sky Praise God, I'm drinking at the fountain That never shall run dry Oh yes, I'm feasting on the manna From a bountiful supply For I am dwelling in Beulah land Far below the storms of doubt Upon the world is beating Sons of men in battle Long the enemy withstand Safe am I within the castle Of God's word retreating Nothing then can reach me Tis Beulah land I'm living on the mountain Underneath the cloudless sky Praise God I'm drinking at the fountain That never shall run dry Oh yes, I'm feasting on the manna From a bountiful supply For I am dwelling in Beulah land Viewing here the works of God, I sink in contemplation. Hearing now His blessed voice, I see the way He planned. Dwelling in the Spirit here, I learn of full salvation. Gladly will I tarry in Beulah land. Sing it out now. I'm living on the mountain. Underneath the cloudless sky, praise God, I'm drinking at the fountain that never shall run dry. Oh yes, I'm feasting on the manna from a bountiful supply, for I am dwelling in Beulah land. Our Elijah series, if you'll turn with me to... 1 Kings chapter 18. The last time in our, our study with Elijah, we, uh, we were looking at the players at Mount Carmel. And this is uh, leading up to the, the grand finale with uh, Elijah. And... Uh, the false prophets. And, uh, we already looked at at uh, Ahab as a natural man. Tonight we're going to look at one of the other characters in this chapter, which is Obadiah. And as we look at Obadiah, I give him the title, The Godly Man in the World. And... Uh, <coughs> when one looks at Obadiah's life, it's seen in light of two different views. First of all, Obadiah is seen as a man who gives lip service to God, but by his life he denies the God that he claims to serve. Now this is one view that's, that's seen from many of the commentators. Uh, they say that o Obadiah sold out to the king. So he is seen as a believer living in a life of compromise. He is one known, uh, one who knows the Lord, but because of power, prosperity, or position, he has chosen to keep his faith a secret. He is a man sold out for personal gain. Now, there, the other view is totally opposite. It's uh, the view of a godly man who is living in a godless generation. 
And many of us, and many of you that have jobs and live in the, this secular world in a secular job can relate to that. He is seen as being in the world, but not of the world. As I looked at this man's character and studied it, uh, I come to believe in the latter. Uh, I see both aspects. But the one thing that you always have to understand and look when you're looking at Scripture is you cannot leave out that the inspiration comes from the Holy Spirit. And by the inspiration I'm talking about, uh, there's nothing about this man's character in chapter 18 that would say that he was sold out to the king. But there are some things about his life and about his character that we'll look at that shows that he is a servant of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. Oh, Lord, I thank you so much for the privilege that we have of coming here tonight and open up your word. Show us tonight, Lord, what you'd have us to learn. Open up our hearts and our minds. We thank you so much. In Christ's name, amen. <coughs> There's three aspects of Obadiah's life I want us to look at uh, that stands out that we'll see in not only his life, but we should be able to see in our own life. So I want to look at this tonight. Look with me at chapter 18 of 1 Kings, and we'll read beginning in verse 18, or verse 1. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab. There was a sore famine in Samaria. And Ahab called Obadiah, which was the governor of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. For it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, that Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave, and fed them with bread and water. Ahab said unto Obadiah, Go into the land unto all fountains of water and unto all brooks. Preventure we may find grass to save the horses and mules alive, that we lose not all the beasts. <clears throat> so they divided the land between them to pass throughout it. Ahab went one way by himself, and Obadiah went the other way by himself. And as Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him, and he knew him fell on his face and said, Aren't thou that my lord Elijah? And he answered him, I am. Go tell thy lord, Behold, Elijah is here. And he said, What have I sinned, that thou wouldest deliver thy servant into the hand of Ahab to slay me? As the Lord thy God liveth, there is no nation or kingdom whether my lord hath not sent to seek thee. And when they said, He is not there, he took an oath of the kingdom and nation that they found thee not. Now thou sayest, Go, tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And it shall come to pass, as soon as I am gone from thee, that the Spirit of the Lord shall carry thee whither I know not. And so when I come and tell Ahab, and he cannot find thee, he shall slay me. But I thy servant fear the Lord from my youth. Was it not told, my Lord, what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord, how I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifty in a cave, and fed them with bread and water? And now thou sayest, Go tell thy Lord, Behold, Elijah is here, and he shall slay me. Elijah said unto, And Elijah said, As the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, I will surely show myself unto him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. <coughs> there are two statements made 
in the context about Obadiah. The first one's in verse 3. It says, now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. And then in verse 12, it says, but thy servant fear the Lord from my youth. The word fear here, uh, the Lord does not mean to be possessed uh, with a slave-like fear. That's not what it's talking about here. It means to love God. It means to love Him. It means to have a strong desire to please God. It means also that you would be in fear of grieving the Lord by our actions. So fear is an emotion that uh, kind of trips us up sometimes to... Uh, to fear the Lord is to resist everything which would displease and which would dishonor God. We need not to lose the fear of God. I'm afraid that in a lot of churches, there is not a desire to fear the Lord like we should. In our study on Elijah, we have seen God's judgment on King Ahab and and Israel because of the refusal to the commandments that God had given them. They are the most wicked, uh, and it is the most wicked time uh, in the the history and up to this time of uh, any of the kings, according to the word of God. (coughs) Just as... uh, as Elijah had went to Ahab, uh, also there's a place for each one of us in God's service, but in that service comes responsibilities. And I don't care if you're in the secular market, what you're, if you're in the ministry, there comes a point where we have to follow the commandments that God gives us. I'm afraid for America tonight. America has lost its fear of the holiness of God. And uh, we see it. America, at one time, think about when you were growing up, how people feared God. People even feared to go to a grocery store on Sundays. There's no fear of that anymore. Do you remember when the only thing that was open on Sunday was the church? It's not that way anymore. This has gotten the way of America in everything. Even in the Christian realm, the almighty dollar has taken control. God has much to say about fearing him in his word. Do you know what the duty of man is? The Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes 12, 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man Deuteronomy 529 oh that there was such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep my commandments always that it might be well with them and with their children forever Psalm 33 8 let all the earth Fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand all of Him. I don't know about you, but when I see God's creation, and Charity and I got to see uh, this past week the, the creations of the Grand Canyon. I'd always wanted to go there. I've been by it. Uh, through there, going, but I never took time to go look at it. And uh, when you look at something so so majestic, uh, there's no way you could ever believe in anything but creation. We have a great, majestic God. Now, the first thing we, I want us to see about Obadiah is... Circumstances 
should not change your fear of the Lord. Your circumstances should not change who you are. Your circumstances should not change what you believe. Circumstances should not change who you are as a Christian. Obadiah, in verse 3, worked among wickedness. Now, I don't know how Obadiah came to know uh, King Ahab. I don't know how he was the head of the palace. The Bible doesn't tell us that. But evidently, he was a steward man. He was, he was good. Uh, he had to be honest. Uh, but uh, to, to be in that kind of a position, he had to be a man that Ahab relied upon. Here's a man who feared God. The Bible tells us twice in this context that he feared God and worked in the palace of the most wicked of couples. I don't know how Obadiah could work under that conditions, but maybe you're here today, you work in a job, and uh, it's not the most pleasant thing or the most pleasant place to be. I've worked in those jobs before where they tell the off-collar jokes, where they make fun of you because they know you're a child of God. It's not easy living and working in those kind of places. I don't imagine that it was easy for Obadiah. <clears throat> we can assume there was something about Obadiah that the king relied upon. The one thing uh, we do know is that Obadiah feared God greatly is what the Bible says. He feared God greatly. And we see evidence of it. I kind of think Obadiah was in the place where God had put him. Sometimes God will put us in a place where he wants us to be that only we can fulfill what God wants us to do. It may not be a pleasant place. It may be in a place where you may be the only Christian. It may be the, a place where you have the only voice for God. Sometimes God has to put people there. It's not a popular place sometimes. And maybe sometimes it might be to see who we are. Turn with me. I want, I want to give you a, a Bible example of what I'm talking about here. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 20. We cannot allow our circumstances to change who and what God wants you to be. Genesis chapter 20. Now, I'm not going to take time to read this whole story. But here, uh, Abraham is in the city of Gehar, and he does not believe that there are any godly people in this place. And he doesn't believe that the king is a God-fearing man. So he tells his, his wife, Sarah, uh, that since she was a very beautiful woman, that she should tell the king that she was Abraham's sister. So in order to protect his life, he tells Sarah to tell Abraham, or the, the king, that they were not married. Now this story is very disturbing to me. And it bothers me when I've read, read this and to, to understand what Abraham was actually doing here. It saddened me when I first read this. Uh, what Abraham is saying here to the king is this is my sister, and if you want her, you can have her. That's sad. That saddens me that Abraham did that. I know why he did it. It was because of his circumstances. But <clears throat> look with me at verse 2. And Abraham said of Sarah his wife, She is my sister. And Amalek, king of Gihar, sent and took Sarah. And Abraham led him. 
But God came to Amalek in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man. For the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. But Amalek had not come near her. And he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, she is my sister. And she, even she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart, in innocency of my hands, have I done this? And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely Die, thou and all are thine. Therefore Amalek rose early in the morning and called all his servants, told all the things in their ears, and the men were so afraid. Then Amalek called Abraham and said unto him, What hast thou done unto us? And what have I offended thee that thou hast brought unto me and on my kingdom a great sin? Thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. And Amalek said unto Abraham, What sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? And Abraham said, Because I thought, Surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. And yet indeed she is my sister, she is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. Now, don't miss, don't miss this, what Abraham said here. Because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place. Do you know what Abraham was saying here? What Abraham is saying is, I thought I was in a godless place. So I thought I could behave godless. <laughs> I didn't think I had to behave as a God-fearing man, because I didn't think there was any other God-fearing people here. God help us tonight to fear God among all things. God help us tonight to be God-fearing Christians in a godless society. It doesn't matter what goes on outside the doors. In a godless society, you will see that. We are to stand up and to be known as God's children. It doesn't matter whether it's on the job. It doesn't matter whether you're at school. It doesn't matter where you are. You are to be a God-fearing, a God-loving, and a God-trusting servant. So circumstances should not change our fear of the Lord. Now second of all, I want you to see uh, the second thing about Obadiah is concealment does not mean compromise. Concealment does not mean compromise. Look back in our text in Kings 18 verse 4. For it was so... When Jezebel cut off the prophet of the Lord, that Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. Obadiah did not bow down to Baal. There was a lot of things that we'll look at in the coming uh, study in Elijah. There was a lot of things going on in Samaria. Not just in Samaria. There was a lot of things going on around the king. There was a lot of things going on in that palace. And when you understand what Baal worship is, in fact, I'm studying in that, some of the things that I come up and read, I will not be able to even announce in this church. It was so awful. 
That was it is a, the most ungodly, the most wickedness of things going on that even uh, Sodom and Gomorrah would have good reason to, to say, why us then? That's how wicked it is. And some of the things, I, I, uh, I couldn't even get my mind around some of it. It was so awful. And so here is a, a godly man living in some of the wickedness ever seen. And he still feared God. And he still didn't bow down. How do we know that? Because in verse 4 here, it tells us that that wicked Jezebel was killing off God's men. She was killing off God's preachers. And this man, Obadiah, took a hundred of them and hid them in a cave. Not only did he hide them, but he fed and watered them. And that tells me something about his character. That tells me something about Obadiah. Because as wicked as she was, had she had known that Obadiah had done this, it was his own death warrant. We, <coughs> we don't know if Ahab knew where Obadiah stood with the Lord. It doesn't say. But we know where Obadiah stood with the Lord because he would protected as much as he could God's men. And he, and he give and protected them by his own life. Those who rebuke Obadiah for working in the palace and being the servant of a wicked Ahab need to understand that sometimes God puts us in a place where we can be used by. It may not be a pleasant place. It may be the most unworldly place God has. But God has a witness always. And we have to understand. You think about some of the missionaries in the past days. Like... Jim Elliot and that crew, how the wickedness of men were to them. But God had a purpose. God always has a purpose. God always has a reason. I see Obadiah as one of God's unsung heroes. He took a chance of getting caught hiding the prophets. I think all the men and women who God has put in certain places at certain times to accomplish his will. Uh, I read this book uh, many years ago when I was in Bible college. And, uh, and I just had been wanting it. In my, I told my daughter and she got it for me. And it's... Uh, the book on uh, Fred Donaldson. Uh, Mr. They called him Mr. Missions. And it was written by his wife, Effie. Uh, one of the couples that inspired me more than anyone was Fred and, and Effie Donaldson, uh, first missionaries uh, with the BBFI. God called them to China in the early 30s. And... Uh, by uh, the time World War II come around, uh, they, Fred had went out into the countryside and uh, had started 25 churches. And uh, when World War II come around, they were in Shanghai and they were put in an internment camp for about 20 months. And uh, as uh, the war... They went back to Shanghai after the war, started many more works in Bible colleges where they stayed until the communists uh, had chased them out. And even today, from all the work that those early missionaries like Fred and Effie did, there's still an underground witness for God in China today because of all those churches and all that, the groundwork that was laid by the Donaldsons and other missionaries like Mrs. Sweet and her husband and others. Uh, so was it pleasant to, to be in an internment camp? If you hear their story, no. 
But was it worth it? Yes. Because the word of God is still being preached in China today because of that witness and because of that. So it is important. And it, uh, where God puts us sometimes, we never know the witness that we will be. <coughs> Daniel and the three Hebrew children were also in the palace. And, uh, but they didn't bow the knee either. It's not always about uh, where God puts us. It's what God wants us to do where he puts us. Obadiah was faithfully God's witness in a degenerate court. As far as it was possible, he tried to serve the Lord. But he also had to serve the king. There's no indications or signs in the text that he was unfaithful to God. He lived and worked in a time where pleasure, passion, wickedness was rapid. Are we there? Yes, we are. It's harder and harder sometimes to be a witness. But God puts us at a certain place. I know because I've had men stand beside me that I've witnessed to that made fun of me that showed me uncolorful pictures and things. It's not easy sometimes. But I've also seen the seed planted in many people. And that's that's the whole idea, is seed planting. Then the last thing I want us to see tonight about Obadiah's life is consecration brings commitment. In verse 7 through 16, the picture of a Christian is their loyalty to the Lord. The one verse of scripture that sheds a light about Obadiah is verse 12. And it shall come to pass, as soon as I am gone from thee, that the Spirit of the Lord shall carry thee whether I know not. And so when I come and tell Ahab, and he cannot find thee, he shall slay me. But I, thy servant, fear the Lord from my youth. The picture of a Christian in their loyalty. Here's a a man serving a wicked king and a wicked queen. The one verse that tells us that he has served God with fear from his youth. Uh, In fact... Evidently, Obadiah had some godly parents. They named him Obadiah, and uh, his name means servant of Jehovah. It would seem that since his childhood, he was given to love the service of God. Building a life of commitment. How does one build a life of commitment with the Lord? Filled with love for God. Why would Obadiah risk his life and hide a hundred prophets? What would make a man and a woman risk their lives in a communist China? What would make a couple take their family to Nicaragua? When there was rioting and things going on? Because the love of God is shed abroad in their hearts. And God has called us all to perform where God puts us. We may not choose where God wants us. Well, we can refuse. We can refuse the Holy Spirit. Just as the pastor talked about this morning. We can refuse what God wants us to do. But you'll be miserable. You won't won't be able to sit still. Because it will always ache at you. But to be filled with the love of God in our hearts compels us to do the things that God asks us to do. And it's not just the love in our hearts. It's believing that where God puts us, God has purpose for us. And in that purpose, He will see it completed through us if we give in to what the Spirit tells us. Continue surrender. 
Surrender is not a one-time act. Obadiah surrenders to the king. He surrenders to God's will also. And he surrenders in the latter part of this chapter to Elijah. Every day, we need to surrender ourselves to the will of God. Every day. Every day we wake up, we need a new surrender with God. Amen? I'm going to tell you something. And you already know this anyway. Every day is a struggle. Every day when you get up, there's something the evil one is going to try to persuade you. It's a, it's a struggle. It's always going to be a struggle till Jesus comes. Amen? It means keeping our commitments. Wholehearted commitment means that you keep on committing. Whatever God commits us to, we commit it to Him, we give it to Him, trusting and believing that God will see it through. If circumstances change or difficulties arise as they will, you keep the commitment you made to serve God. God always has first place. Let me conclude. There's three lessons to take from Obadiah's story. First of all, don't be distracted. There's a lot of things to distract us. Obadiah did not allow the wickedness of where he was or who he was with to distract him from the loyalty that he feared in God. Second of all, don't become complacent. I'm, I fear this is the Christian's downfall. We become complacent with soul winning, witnessing, telling others. Obadiah wouldn't allow himself to be satisfied with the current situation he was in. He tried and done all he could do. He did everything he could to help the prophets. He kept trying to change to do right. He didn't allow the wickedness to overrun his life. And then the last lesson from Obadiah's life, don't compromise. Obadiah kept the same convictions he had from his early days and his youth. Oh, would to God that our young people had some convictions and some commitments to God. That's why we have Vacation Bible School. That's why next a week from tomorrow we will start Vacation Bible School so that we might be able to, to put and instill in some young people's lives what God has in store for. We need some young people, amen? We need some new servants. I don't know how long the, this pastor is going to be able to stand up here. God may give him another 10 years. I don't know. He don't know. But I do know this. We are not replenishing the mission field with young people as much as we did. We're not replenishing the pulpits with trained, sold out, committed men of God. And they're going to get it in church. They're going to get it in our Sunday school classes. They're going to get it in vacation Bible school. That's where it begins. If we can get those young people sold out to God in vacation Bible school, if we can get them committed to going to church on a regular basis, by the time they're a teenager, we will do something that God wants to be done. <laughs> Obadiah? No, I don't think that he was sold out to the King Ahab. I truly believe he was sold out to God Almighty. Stand with me if you would. I'll stay.